Okay, so I'm happy to be the host today for the uh, Nanotox Volume 2. Um, this is a new uh, monthly schedule we are going to have. Uh, and I would like first to thank Horizon Sky Communication and especially Felipe for all the organization he has made. He's will be, he will be in charge of the technical aspects today. If you have any issue, just uh, chat to him directly. Um, the Nanotox uh, Volume 2 uh, is organized with Aurora uh, by a, co um, a, let's say a committee that is composed of uh, Felipe Valeros, um, Valero, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it that well, uh, Clara Bolton, Sarah Alvarez, Alicia Khan, and myself. Uh, we are planning monthly talks and we want to uh, focus on um, recent uh, interesting publication that can be uh, interesting for, uh, let's say, wide aspects in uh, nanoplankton research. And also we'll be inviting a young scientist to, uh, to be able to uh, talk about their research and to uh, meet the community. Um, Today, we um, uh, let, just let me check uh, before I didn't forget anything. Yeah, and I, of course, I would like to thank uh, Juliana Villa that just arrived. I saw that. Uh, I would like to thank her uh, to support uh, this uh, Nanotox uh, Volume 2. And we'll be uh, communicating, communicating through her uh, for the next Nanotox, uh, we have not planned the date yet, neither the speakers, but we've done all the scaling uh, in the following, um, I would say, days, week. I think I'm fine. I didn't forget anything. Clara, maybe uh, any comments? No, that's fine. No, I think you've said everything. All right, thanks. Um, so we can now go to the presentation today. Uh, we have invited Gerard Langer because he has published a recent in um, recently, sorry, in a New Phytologist, if I remember well, this um, study called "Role of Silicon in the Development of Complex Crystal Shapes in Coccolithophores." We we have then invited him, and just before he will start uh, his presentation, I will just remember a uh, few aspects of uh, Gerard's career. So Gerard Langer is specialist in coccolite calcification um, biology. He has been working quite intens intensively on living in cultures um, of coccolithophores. And he has been recently uh, quite interesting also in uh, holococcolites. He has been working for the Marine Biological Association in Plymouth for the past five years as a research associate and has been working through time uh, in the UK, Spain, and Germany. And then I will give him uh, now the, um, I will let him speak about this presentation he's going to do, it will last for 15 to 20 minutes. Just if you have any questions, add, uh, you can uh, write your questions in the chat room, whether on YouTube or in Zoom, uh, the Aurora team will uh, send me the question and at the end of the talk, I will uh, manage the Q&A. So I will read the questions that will be in the chat or if someone wants to uh, want to take the, um, uh, the speak, uh, they must ask me before, please, in order not to have everybody speaking at the same time. I think we are also done on that part. So uh, Gerard, are you here? Yep. So I, I leave you now the talk. All right, thank you very much. And I'll try to get my talk on the screen. So I hope that works. Does it work? It does indeed. Okay, great. Thanks again, Artiste, and thanks to the organizing nano talks organizing committee it's a, it's a very good idea to do these talks 
And yeah, as Baptiste said, I will speak today about the role of silicon in corporate fork calcification. Now that might sound strange to some of you because as you all know, coccoliths um, contain calcium carbonate, precisely calcite, and usually silicon is associated with diatom fustules. And um, not many people have thought about silicon in coccolithophores and coccoliths. And this is because until recently, it was unknown that coccolithophores might require silicon to calcify. That was actually first published in 2016. It's a study by Christina Durak et al. And in this paper, they showed that some, not all, some coccolithophores need silicon to grow and calcify. And they could clearly show that they need silicon to calcify, but they left the question open why they need silicon to calcify, because calcification in coccolithophores, as you might know, is a very complex set of processes, and there are many, and they, they range from calcium transport, cellular calcium transport, cellular inorganic carbon transport, to vesicle transport, exocytosis, and um, a lot of other things. The morphogenesis of coccoliths is in particular is very complicated and we know relatively little about it. You might remember Jeremy's talk and he spoke about that. So we, we have all these processes and it's, it was quite unclear where silicon comes in and uh, what, what its role might be. So that's what this talk is partly about. I should say partly because I give you a warning for the first half of the talk, I'll not talk about silicon at all, which is strange, but uh, it, I hope that will um, become clear as I go along because I want to make a few other points which will be helpful uh, in understanding the role of silicon. And that was something which, um, which came together quite nicely when we try to find out more about silicon. So enough of the introduction, I go right into the thing we're interested in here, which is coccolith crystals. And coccoliths are very complex structures. They are very beautiful. And if you um, listen to Jeremy's talk, you know all about them. And this is quite a lot. So we, we know a lot about their structure. And they have these beautiful crystals. You can see here on the right, the left hand side, actually, as an example of Coccolithus baudii. And on the right hand side, you see a couple of other example images Coccolithus and the Coccospheres. So we have these crystals. And what's interesting about them is they have various shapes and sizes. So that's quite amazing because calcium carbonate to shape it in that way is difficult. So um, that's the, the question is really how is that done? And um, I say these elements you can see here, for instance, the V or R units you can see on the left hand side, upper left corner uh, are, are crystals, are single crystals. Now that's debatable. And um, I will not go into detail now, but if you want to find out more about this very important question, it's not so important in the context of this talk, but it is important if we are to understand coccolith formation and coccolith crystallization. So uh, this is a, a review paper recently, came out recently, actually a couple of days ago, and it, uh, it's, it states the question and states the importance of the questions and possible ways to solve it, I think for the first time. And so check it out if you want to know more about whether coccolith crystals are really single crystals, but um, for the moment I call them single crystals. So we're talking about these crystals, but actually not all of them have these really intricately shaped crystals, these big 
crystals of various sizes and shapes, there is another life cycle phase, as you probably know, so I'm not going to go into any detail here, but you probably all know that the so-called heterocochlid life cycle phase produces these heterocochlids with the, um, the big crystals, different shapes and sizes. You can see here an example of Chalcidiscus, famous one, uh, so the heterocochlids in brown and um, but below them, you see these smaller coccolids, the hollow coccolids, and they are composed of these tiny crystals. And this is quite different from what the heterococcolids produce. And this is amazing because it's the same species. It's just a different life cycle phase. So if we look at the hollow coccolids for crystals in a bit more detail, we see that they are small, they are all of the same size and all of the same shape. They are rhombic, which is interesting because it looks comparatively simple if you compare it to the heterocochlid crystals. And also it is a shape which is typical for inorganically precipitated calcite you can see on the lower right. So this is a shape which you do not need to do much to get it. Uh, you can precipitate it in a beaker. And the example you see on the lower right is, is in a lab, is a lab precipitated calcite basically in a beaker. So that's, that's easy in terms of how you shape a crystal, do the morphogenesis. And um, so that's very, very different from, from the heterocochlear force. And, and that seems to fit because the generally accepted idea is that the calcification process of heterocochlear force and holococlear force are totally different. So whereas the heterocochlear coccolids are produced intracellularly in specialized vesicle, highly controlled chemical environment and so on, the holococlids are supposed to be produced extracellularly on the surface of the cell in a less controlled environment and in a, in a totally different way. And that would fit the, the, the simple crystals which you can produce in the beaker. So why can you not produce them on the surface of the cell? And uh, there's also the idea that because these mechanisms are so totally different and because we find in the fossil record, we find the hollow um, later, uh, later than the, um, so they appear later, so they are younger than the heterococcolids. Uh, that means that it must have been a, a reinvention of calcification by cochlear the force. So they, they reinvented it totally new from scratch and a totally different mechanism. So that, that all seems to make sense if you look at these simple crystals. However, and now I come to the um, first bit of our study, which was looking at holococlear force and how they calcify. So contrary to what I just said, holococlear force actually do calcify intracellular in a vesicle in very much the same way as heterocochlear the force do. And you can see here uh, transmission electron microscope images showing this. So the, um, the top two images show three crystals on a scale in a vesicle, in a cell. In the middle you have various crystals. So the crystal, well, I should say that uh, the top image shows holes in the resin. That's why they're white, they're not crystals. Uh, holes in the resin in the middle image, however, this is black. These are real crystals. They're not fallen out of the resin. So I'm not going into technical details here. If you don't know about TEM preparation and so on, don't worry about that. Um, just take my word for it that these, these are crystals inside the cell. And you can also see these yellow things um, in the middle right picture, which show you um, a so-called energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy analysis, which is a way where you can use that in order to say something about the elements in your structure. And uh, so it has a very strong calcium signal. So it's pretty clear there must be 
cal calcium carbonate. So these are these are calcite crystals. Um, and so we have two different species here. The, the top images show coccolithus and the lower one shows Calyptosphira. Right, so this is quite a change in terms of what we thought we knew about Holococcus for calcification. It completely changes the picture because it's not a totally different mechanism, fundamentally different, but actually it's very much the same mechanism. So the fundamental thing is that it's inside this vesicle and then exocytosed upon completion is very much the same. So we have to rethink that that bit of the story. And I just mention that the discovery that heterococcolids, I should say, are produced inside the cell and then upon completion um, extruded, it goes back to Dixon in 1900. It's a, a top right um, sketch you can see. That's what he, what he did at the time uh, using his light microscope. And you might remember that from Jeremy's talk. Uh, so I just wanted to, to mention that because it, it, it gives you an idea. So if you consider that cochlear falls were first described, I think it was in the late 1860s. So after some 30 years, Dixon discovered that heterococlids are produced um, inside the cell, but actually it took another 120 years to find out that hollow coccolids are also produced inside the cells. So that tells you a little bit about how difficult it is to, to find that. And it took us a long time. Now, there's another line of evidence that these hollow coccolids are produced inside the cell. And this is the chemistry um, of these, of these, of the calcite. It just mentioned that, um, that if you produce calcite in seawater, it's, it has a relatively high magnesium content. And uh, in the top um, picture, you can see an EDS um, analysis of the magnesium uh, of an extracellular calcifier, marine calcifier, the foraminifera and the China, the Sony eye. And it has a clearly detectable uh, magnesium peak. However, the coccolids of both coccolithus and calcidiscus, they don't have any detectable magnesium peak, um, and neither the heterococcolids nor the holococcolids. So that again shows you that um, it's highly unlikely that this calcite was produced in contact with seawater. So I come now to silicon. Um, if we want to study the need for silicon in calcification, we have one powerful tool, which is germanium. Germanium is an analog, it's a silicon analog, and it kind of um, blocks the silicon, um, it's a competitor, and it kind of blocks silicon uptake. So we can use it to simulate silicon starvation, um, because silicon starvation is actually very, very difficult to uh, achieve. And I come back to that a bit later. But what you can see here is growth rates measured under germanium influence and of various holococcus force, and they don't show any difference to the control. There's no effect. They don't need silicon. Um, I show the example of Xerox Fara Pulcra because it's a bit different than the others, uh, it's very sensitive to germanium. And looking at the, uh, the, the panels in B, the left-hand side, you might get the impression, oh, if you, if you use germanium and you have this lower growth rate. So that, that, that's kind of, um, that's something. Well, I should, I should start actually with a with panel in C because the hollow coccolith force of Circus Fira, they are much more sensitive to germanium than the other holococcus horse, Cassidiscus, Coccolatus, Calyptus Fira, and so on. So that might give you the impression that the holococcus horse is sensitive to germanium, i.e. needs silicon, um, but 
the, the comparison you can see here clearly shows you that that's not the case. So uh, the, the germanium silicon ratio of one uh, affects the growth rate a bit, but they still calcify completely normally, which, which you can see in, in uh, the pictures down there bottom. Um, and this is a ratio which kills all other, uh, all heterococtyl force uh, indeed. And if you compare that to the hetero Zero poor car, you can see a clear, clear difference. So if you if you grow them, the heterococlid is four in a germanium to silicon ratio of roughly 0.1. It has a massively reduced growth rate in the holococlid four. That's not the case. And calcification is unaffected. So that's very important. So the take home message here is holococlid fours don't need silicon. And remember, they have these simple rhombic crystals. So if we look at heterococlids of force by contrast, they do some of them. And I not go to, into too much detail about um, which do and which don't. So for the present talk, I would like to focus on the ones which do. So here's an example, coclis baudii. And if grown, if grown under um, on the germanium treatment, which mimics silicon starvation, you can see that the percentage of malformation, cochlear malformations increases. And that's interesting. That, in principle, has been documented before in the, in the Dirac paper in 2016. However, we analyzed the cochlear morphology in a bit more detail and we found that actually some of the malformations you can see under the germanium treatment are specific to they only occur if you treat them with, with germanium other stressors uh, will not produce these kinds of malformations and we call them rom like and rom malformations the rom malformations is a, in particular interesting um, because it's basically a calcite rom and you might think, yeah, well, how do you know that's actually uh, supposed to be a coccolis? We do know for several reasons. I not go into all of them. I just give you one of the reasons, which is it has a typically low magnesium content. So if it would be an inorganic precipitation from the seawater they grown in, you would expect the high magnesium, remember? So uh, this is one of their other reasons, but um, we, we are absolutely certain that these are coccolids and they look like an inorganically precipitated calcite. Now, you can see with this example that there's something wrong here with crystal shape. So these coccolids, they have malformed crystals. So the, the, that's, that's very um, striking. I give you just one other example which is Syracusphyra, uh, net, not, uh, um, Syracusphyra, sorry. So here we have an effect as well of the germanium treatment, and it also produces several types of malformations. Among them, the germanium specific malformations you can see in the top. This is a malformation which is um, very, very rare in other samples. You would probably never find it. So it's that's why it, we call it specific. So if you treat it with germanium, you find it in this percentage, this which is incredibly high compared to what you find in other samples. And um, now, if you look at the plot in B, that shows you one example of a low silicon seawater experiment. Uh, as I said, these are very difficult to do because to get that seawater, natural seawater, I should say, this low silicon concentration is very, very difficult. And um, the 0.2 micromolar we used here is just about what you need. If you go a little bit higher, um, they will be perfectly happy. But here we can see that in, in the 0.2 micromolar silicon seawater, silicate seawater, I should say, uh, you get these specific germanium-induced malformations, um, which we call the type C. 
And um, this clearly shows that the, the effect of germanium is not some kind of generic effect, which, you know, poisons, whatever, and then you get these malformations and it really got nothing to do with specific uh, calcification processes and so on. Uh, so I think, and silicon and, and all the rest of it, so that might be this argument, but uh, I think that the low um, silicon experiment shows that um, that's not really the case. So the take home message here is that it's the crystal, it's the complex crystal shapes of the heterococcal force which require the silicon in some way um, to be formed. So the cochlear force cell needs the silicon in some way, not at all sure how and how exactly, but uh, that's the point where it comes in. So it's nothing to do with, with say calcium transport or something like this. Um, they can produce massive calcite structures. Um, that's not the problem. So we really have a specific morphogenetic um, effect here. And it is these complex crystal shapes and the, the simple rhombic crystal shapes of the holocaust walls. They don't need this um, process requiring silicon, including silicon, whatever the exact process is. So to finish, I just want to give you um, a slightly revised um, idea of how um, cochlids could have evolved. This is, um, is again, I shouldn't say against, this is, um, is an alternative version to what's, what you probably have heard before, which is that the, the um, Heterococlids of course, the heterococlids came first and then the holococlids was well, as well, reinvention, later reinvention, uh, as I mentioned. And what we now would like to suggest is that probably there was a non-calcified ancestor which produced these organic scales intracellularly and they performed some of the functions in terms of protection that, that later uh, coclids would. And then what happened was at some point the scales um, or whatever you call them, um, were calcified with simple rhombic crystals like uh, we find now in the uh, modern holococlith force. And that basically was the stage where holococlith force developed um, step by step. Um, and then later there came in a mechanism which allowed shaping these little rhombic crystals into big, variously shaped uh, crystals and allowing to form such structures as interlocking cochlear spheres, sorry, uh, spheres of the, let's say, cochlear bearing species such as calcidiscus. And this silicon dependent mechanism allowed this, and, and this is where the heterocochlids and heterocochlids of course come in. So they they um, utilize this silicon dependent <coughs> mechanism. And some lineages lost it later because not all of them need it, as I mentioned, but um, I don't not say no more about that now. <coughs> so I leave you with that and thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Gerard. What's brilliant presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, for this presentation. Um, if there is anybody that wants to uh, ask a question, you can add it in the chat room. Uh, or if you want to ask the question yourself, just tell me, hands up, and I give you the right to do, ask your question. Anybody wants to? Yes, Jeremy? Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, Jeremy and then Ines. Nah, lovely talk, Gerald. Where's Gerald gone? He's not, I guess you haven't got your video to get your camera on. But no, that was really nice. Fascinating stuff. Um, so, what do you, do you have any feeling for what, for how the silicon is it, how the silicon works in crystal shaping? Do you think it's, do you think it's, can it act as a cytoskeletal inhibitor in some way? Or do you think it's changing something like the polysaccharides? I try yeah that's a that's a very good that's a very good question thank you jeremy i try to um get myself on the 
video. Give me a second. Um, I hope that works. Yay, hi, Joe. Okay, hello. Uh, great, yeah. Uh, yeah, th thanks, that's a, that's a great question. And um, I think we can be fairly sure that it's nothing to do with the cytoskeleton because comparing, um, so we did um, another um, set of experiments where we uh, used cytoskeleton inhibitors on uh, cognitus and um, skips far up Steinii and compared the malformations you get to the malformations you get from uh, from germanium and uh, they're totally different. So uh, th th this suggests that it's really nothing to do with the cytoskeleton and um, and I would I would indeed say your suggestion with the polysaccharides is a very good one. That's actually my favorite idea. So I think that that must be it. And the way I see it, which is pure speculation, is that the silicon is a structural component of one of the polysaccharides used in morpho morphogenesis of the coccolids. And um, so that's not completely wild idea because it's, it's known that silicon is a structural component of some macroalgae polysaccharides, so that, that in principle, uh, such things exist. And I think that's, that's a way to, um, yeah, to, to look a bit more into in the future. Thank you. Um, then uh, Ines. Thanks. Yes, hello everybody. Uh, I have one question regarding silicon. Uh, I didn't understand quietly. Does silicon uh, give malformation uh, to coccolids or uh, you said something uh, on the uh, uh, not last night, uh, the picture before that, uh, that uh, we can see some kind of malformation. Uh, but I'm not sure uh, what uh, did you want to say? Uh, that slight malformation of, uh, is it uh, when silicon in the marines uh, water column are increased, then it's much higher malformations. I didn't understand quietly. Um, no, actually, it's the it's the it's the opposite. So, um, if you starve them of silicon silicate, I should say, in the water. So, in the water, you normally, as you all know, you have a certain silicate concentration, and there's a huge range. Um, and in in natural seawater, if it's very very low, it goes down to values round about 0.2 micromolar. And that's actually, if we use that in an experiment, if we get seawater that low in silicate, then we find these um, interesting malformations, which you also get if you um, treat them in an experiment with germanium, which is this um, analog inhibitor thing. So this is a kind of poison which specifically acts to um, block silicate uptake and um, so the idea here would be they need silicon silicate but they need silicon they take up silicate but they need silicon in some way to produce normal coccolids so if you take that away then they will not produce normal coccolids and there will be these malformations and they will in some cases be very specific to the silicon starvation so does, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, because um, I was um, studied lot, uh, lots of uh, marginal marine environment and uh, I didn't found out uh, malformations of coccolids in assemblage with uh, diatom, silicoflagellates and other silicon species. Uh, that developed uh, their parts from silica. And I totally agree with you. I thought I understand differently that you said uh, in your presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ines. Uh, Juliana was uh, wanted to ask a question, so you go. Yes, okay. <clears throat> Can you see me? Yeah. First of all, I want to thank you 
Gerald, for this in innovative uh, discussion, very interesting. And also, I want to thank uh, for the organizer, Baptiste, Philippe, Aurora, Alicia, all the guys that um, organized this uh, new session of NanoTalks. It is uh, very important to keep alive our community. And of course, you, Gerald, for to be the first of this uh, run of talks. My very quick uh, question is, uh, is do you think as a, there is, can be um, uh, an influence of, uh, so, sorry for the dog, <laughs> an influence of um, uh, volcanism, and so emission of silica in some part of the ocean for the nanophos, for the nanoplankton. I remember in some paper, I think of Bakri, you know the paper that he was <clears throat> mentioning that uh, this cluster sinus was more abundant uh, in, in the area of uh, volcanic activity. And that could be something related to silica emission. Uh, it's a very difficult question. So I think what, what we not entirely sure, well, well, actually what we know next to nothing about is what is the, um, does silicon starvation in the oceans out there in the field really cause a problem? Because as I said, um, in order to starve them of silicon, just by lowering the silicate concentration, you have to go very low. And um, you have to go so low, in fact, that it's just about what you get in natural seawater in some places sometimes. So there's this example, um, which you can see in one of, I think it's in, in Louisa Cross is um, like, she has this guide to the Western Met, uh, this beautiful, beautiful book essentially with all the, all the cockles, you probably know it. And uh, there actually is a picture of a, um, a Syracuse Fira pulchra coccolith, which has the Germanium specific malformation. And uh, so it comes from um, an area and a time of year in midsummer where the silicate concentration can be as low as 0.2 micromolar, which is exactly what we used in the experiment to produce the same type of malformation. So I think in, in, in those areas and at those times, you getting close um, in all other areas and at all other times, it's probably not really an issue. That's my gut feeling. Um, we know very little. And um, as I said, it's, it's very hard to judge. So all I can tell you is that um, the danger comes if you go to the area of 0.2 micromolar. If you're higher than that, um, they are perfectly happy. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, Juliana. So, uh, Georges wanted to ask a question. Do you want me to read your question, Georges? Yeah, that's right, I guess. Okay, no answer. So, I will read it myself. He asked what uh, made you start your, your study with silica and not other elements. And he's asking if there, there is any, the same behavior with any other elements you might think of. Or you, um, you, you uh, I don't know, you, you suppose that might be uh, the effect of other elements the same way as uh, silica? It's a very good question. Um... And I'm not sure I can satisfactorily answer it, but um, I would say this. So the first question is easy to answer. Um, so what 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 got me started on silicon? It was basically the the Durac uh, 2016 paper and the chance I had at the time uh, to go to the MBA in Plymouth, where they done this um, study. So um, that was basically it. I was uh, talking to uh, Colin Brownlee about it and I was uh, immediately hooked and I said yeah that sounds super interesting let's do it so that's that's the answer to that um, the second question is more difficult and um, I think that we don't really have we can't really single out another element like that at the moment um, 
there is this very special case where we we had the idea that it might be uh, might have a kind of morphogenetic function, which is strontium, in fact, in uh, Schiffer Absteini. I um, so I should say that strontium in Schiffer Absteini is unusually high. It's much higher than in other uh, cochlear pores, and so the idea was maybe it's got a morphogenetic function there, but it hasn't. Apparently, it hasn't. Um, we, we, we did an experiment and um, lowered the strontium concentration and there was no problem. Uh, in fact, uh, if you increase the strontium concentration in the seawater a lot, then, then it becomes a problem. So uh, it, it doesn't seem to, to be in any way uh, involved in, in the morphogenetic process in the same way uh, silicon is. So I, I would say I can't give you, at the moment, I can't give you another element like that with such a modulating uh, function. There will be a lot of elements involved in general, um, but that's more general. I mean, you can point to uh, the, the general cell physiology of magnesium and so on, um, but that's not really the same thing, I guess. That, that's, that's, that's very different. So yeah, that, that would be my answer to that. Thank you very much, Gerard. Patricia wanted to ask you a question. And uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Sorry, I was a bit late, but I didn't want to miss it. Um, so actually, it's very great to see you and also the other that I didn't see for a while. Hi, Patricia. <laughs> so um, I wanted to ask you, I mean, malformation is a very complex topic for cochlear operas. And I guess we started to know more about malformation when, when all these experimental notion of certification were basically developed and then we saw the high CO2. In some cases, we had malformation. So the first question is about the type of malformation that you detected when you do an experiment, a certification experiment. Is it um, comparable or is different than the one that you see in low silicon condition? And the other one is like, how much you know about this specific response to this limitation in terms of silicon limitation? Um, well, the second, I'm not sure I get the second question completely, but um, I, I come back to that in a second. The first question is an interesting one. And as far as we can say now, so one big problem I, I have here in answering that question is that, uh, as you know, as you well know, probably better than many other people, uh, that most of the ocean acidification work was done on EHUX. And, uh, and we, we, we have a problem that EHUX does not need silicon. So that's a, that you can't compare that. So that's a problem. So what do you compare? And um, the best candidate would be Coxitus. So and luckily, I can compare that because we have an as yet unpublished data set we're working on at the moment. Um, it was done by, um, by uh, Doro Kottmeyer at the MBA. And she looked at, um, at effects of acidification in cochlitis in more detail. And uh, we also analyzed the morphology. And I can tell you that um, this is a different story. So the malformations you get from germanium are very different from the ones you get from um, acidification. So this is a different um, mechanism. Um, I'm pretty sure I can say that. Okay, I hope that sort of answers your question. It's, it's very hard because we don't have a lot of data, but um, watch this space. The, the, I hope we will be able to um, to submit the, the um, the acidification manuscript soon. Um, the second question, so I, I think, do I get this right? The second question is what do we actually know about how silicon works? Is, is that right? Basically, yes. Practically, it's like how much we know about the species specific uh, need of silicon. Oh, all right. Okay, 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 species specific, yes. Um, so what, what we know is that there seem to be species um, which don't need silicon and they, they're not completely random. They kind of phylogenetically, they cluster. Um, so EHUX and, and G5 Capsa, they don't need silicon. Um, Pleochrysis carteri doesn't need silicon. And you have, you have a few of those. 
and uh, they're, they're coming these clusters. So that's why we get the idea that uh, it was probably originally a mechanism which all heterocopic was used, and then it was lost at, at several times in evolutionary history. So that's the idea. So it's species specific, yes. Um, and in, there's a bit more species specificity, uh, specificity I think, to that. Um, in, in terms of what kinds of malformations you get, but that's a that's a long story, and um, we'll we'll hopefully publish a separate paper about that. We we have much more data, so this is um, this is something we we want to look at in more detail in the future. But yeah, that is is specific, and um, so so the general idea would be you have that as an original requirement, the silicon, and then it, it gets lost several times. Yeah, can I ask something else quickly? Yeah, yeah. You are, you go yeah. and then it would be Jeremy. You you finish your question and then Jeremy. Sorry. So um, you mentioned the work of Louisa in Western Med and, and possible malformation there. I was wondering, like the challenge of really looking at natural environment and malformation there, and then be able to detect different type of malformation depending on the condition because. First of all, I guess they are very rare because you mentioned the conditions are very, very unusual for the natural environment. So I guess you think you are confident enough that you can detect different de malformation um, and then say what type of malformation is like in, in, in terms of silicon. I think, yeah, I mean, yes, in, in, in some cases. So uh, certainly the ones I presented, so um, in, in Coglitus, um, especially in, in Seracus phyra, it's very easy. And uh, there's another example, Skips phyra abstinei, it's also very, very easy to, to detect that. So if, if you find in a natural sample, if you find these malformations, they're easily recognizable and you can directly relate them to silicon starvation. So that's very easy. It's not the case in all silicon requiring species, I should say, but that's, as I said, these, these are different data which will hopefully come out later. But um, but yeah, there, so there, there, there are differences, but we have at least three species which produce these very specific malformations you would recognize in an env environmental sample, yes. Okay, thank you. So Jeremy was uh, wanted to ask you another question, you go. Yeah, well, it just seems an extraordinary coincidence and do you think it is that Chlorochrysis carteri and Jephyra capsomeliania don't need silica? And they're also the ones which don't produce holococcalypse. Yeah. The other ones are unrelated. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing coincidence, isn't it? It is. It is. I, yeah, I, we, we thought about it, but um, well, I can't tell you much more about it, actually. But it is interesting. I'm not sure exactly what it means, but, um, but yeah, that's right. That's right. So in, in, these, in these species, the typical species where you have this silicon dependency, um, they they need to calcify in the hetero phase. And also they calcify, they don't necessarily need to, but they do calcify in the, usually in the hollow phase. So um, that's right. Um, yeah, that's, that's all we can, we can say. You're right. I mean, it's, it's, it is interesting. Have you tried testing in Hymenomonas then? Um, yeah, one more test of whether that, that correlation holds. I think we actually didn't, as far as I remember. Might be worth just pushing it to see if that correlation really holds as you go through that. Um, if we did, let me think, we did a few other species and um, I think it, I'm not sure at the moment, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, there is a question from YouTube, so I will read it for you. Uh, it's from Barney Balch. Is anything known how the holococolitophores regulate the shape of individual holococolites in stacking the rhombic crystals into very regular species specific structures? Thank you. Uh, thanks. That's a great question. I'd love to know the answer. 
but I can't tell you. We don't know. But it is it is one of the, I think it's one of the big questions. And I remember discussing that question with many people, especially Jeremy, over the years. And uh, yeah, we, we simply don't know, uh, unless Jeremy has another idea. But uh, <laughs> it was, it, it, it is very, very tricky. And I think that um, what we, what, how I imagine is, is that in, in principle, um, the morphogenetic machinery of holocultural force and heterocultural force is probably very similar. So you get this, this cytoskeleton, um, the idea that the cytoskeleton exerts a force on the visa the membrane and so on. I think that holds for, uh, for holocultural force as well. And that, that must be part of it. But, um, but yeah, it's, um, I, I can't tell you. It's, it's one of the big, big questions, I think. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, Amos Winter, I wanted to ask you a question. Ah. Your, Amos, your microphone is off. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, uh, how's everybody? Nice to see you all. Do you have um, just a question, but maybe a stupid question, but uh, I just looked at the history of uh, silica. And, uh, you know, it was like uh, 80, 80 uh, milligrams per liter uh, just at the start of the Jurassic and has gone down to uh, nearly uh, zero. Today, I was wondering if that, do you think that has any implications for uh, the evolution of uh, uh, hetero uh, hollow coccolithophore evolution. Yeah, because right now we're you know lowest it's ever been. Yeah, yeah. I think that. How well, does that fit in? That's well. That's a that's a um, that's a good question, and I'm not sure really. For well, I mean there are two things here. So one is, as I said, not all heterococcolithophores they do need silicon. So it was lost later. So I think maybe that's to do with the lowering of the silicate concentration you mentioned, but also um, it's, yes, it's low, um, but again, if you look at silicate concentrations in the present day surface water, it's not that low. So in most places at most times of the year, um, these Cognitive force, the heterocognitive force requiring silicon should still be okay. So I'm not sure how great an influence that has. Um, it, it, it relates to this e ecological question. So what does it mean for ecology and blooms and so on? So I think mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not sure, but you're right. I mean, the, 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 the fact that it goes lower is certainly um, can certainly become a problem, um, whether it has been a problem over the last, I don't know, hundred thousands, millions of years, is very hard to say. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. You know, when they, you, you know, when there was a switch from, what did you say it went from a hollow? I can't think anymore, hollow to hetero. No, from hetero to hollow, and then there was a switch. When was that? Well, I, well, I don't know. Um, I think what happened, I mean, what we, what we just well, what is what we just suggesting is that the hollow um, evolved first. So you go right back to the uh, beginning of cognitive force, and you the first things you have are hollow phases, and then later uh, the heterocognitive force come in. I think that can be timed because we we have the first appearance of heterocognitive yeah, quite early. You're in the audience. Happened? Quite early. Uh, we go back to, uh, I think, uh, certainly um, more than 100 million years, right? So that's that's quite early. And um, like, so, but the point is, um, I, I'm not sure what, because we have this drop in, in silicon at some point, um, in silicate, I should say, but um, it's not at all clear whether that had any kind of 
effect on um, the evolution or the classification of the species at the time. So I think that that's a tricky one. And my gut feeling is the silicate concentrations were over geological time way too high to, to, to make a difference in terms of what we know about present day um, species in terms of their requirement. That said, it could be that in the past, the requirement was higher in the sense that they needed higher silicate concentrations and that might have uh, but this is all speculation, and since we don't know, you know, I can't really, I can't I really understand. It's just something to think about. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. It is an interesting point, and it would be good to um, to to look into this bit more detail. But it is tricky. So uh, yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you, Amos. Uh, there is a new another question from. I, I'm sorry for the name because I, I don't know how to pronounce it, but Eric Chang Cheng, I'm sorry, uh, sorry for the name. Uh, but anyway, uh, it says great talk. I was wondering, did you check whether the morphology of the base bait was affected upon Germanian treatment? We didn't. Um, but that's something we are looking into right now. So, um, yeah, hopefully can tell you in the future, um, but at the moment it's not clear. I think the first, um, the first impression we get from a few preliminary data is that um, it might be affected, but that's not in any way um, statistical and I can't really, can't really confirm that. So um, basically unknown. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I guess we are out of question and it's been an hour now, so I think we can close it for today, I guess, uh, except if there is a last question from anybody. One last bit. Okay, Jeremy. point to Micromoles, is that about the level which diatoms reduce silica to if they're because fundamentally, fundamentally silica levels are low in the oceans when they've been stripped out by diatoms and diatoms will reduce it, reduce silica down to a level where they then can no longer extract silica. So is that 0.2 micron level essentially the level which diatoms reduce silica to? That's right. And so then it might, which might suggest indeed that Talking of have had to evolve to that level. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that that's that's right. They certainly, um, in fact, not all diatom species can do that. So um, if you use different species, some of them they will not go down to 0 0.2 micromolar, but some of them will. So it it really depends. But um, certainly they cannot go any lower. And it's hard for them to go to the point too, whereas with the cockles we looked at, they, you have to be at least as low as point two, preferably lower, but it's very, very difficult to get that. So, um, yeah, so I think you're right. I mean, there is a difference. Co Cochlear are much more efficient. They can take up silicate much better than diatoms can. Especially in the North Atlantic, there's a sort of general ecological story of basically the diatoms flourish during the spring bloom until they reduce the silica level down to the level where they can no longer and then copper the are able to come with their still, still nitrate and phosphate so the silica is going down. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think there is no more questions so I would like to conclude them. Uh, oh wait. Uh, there is an, just the last question that came out. Let's say it's the last one for today. I guess it's coming from YouTube. Um, could the silicate concentration in Mesozoic Ocean be related with the emergence of muralites? And the decrease on, in silicate could be related with the placolite emergence? It's a, a tricky question, I would say. That. That's a very tricky question. I would say no. Um, for one reason, basically, which is that the silicon, 
the amount of silicon in coccolids is very, very low. Um, we, we, we haven't published the numbers yet, but we, we will hopefully um, in the near future be able to do that. And, uh, but I can tell you it's very low and I think it's just not sufficient. Um, so, but I haven't done any budget calculations, I should say. So it, that is basically a gut feeling based on a very, very low amount of silica silicon in coccolids. But, um, but yeah, so. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I guess we, we can uh, stop here for today. You are, the, the, the discussion was great uh, indeed. Uh, it opens a lot of uh, direction, but uh, the study was great and the talk was great. That's why uh, everything went fine, I guess, at the end. A great discussion. And we, I'm quite happy, actually, uh, we have this great discussion because the Nanotalks Volume 2 was indeed uh, it was done to make um, the community get back together because we are we are not been able to uh, see each other for a long time. INA will be post is as postponed from one year, so we will not have we will not be able to see each other uh, in a real life. I don't know how to say that uh, until next year. So that's great. We can have this discussion, and um, your study was really interesting and make us uh, connected and discuss in different people having different specialties. I would like to thank everybody and especially uh, Gerard that was the first one to do that this year. Um, we will uh, send um, uh, the next speaker will be uh, chosen in the following days. We will have the uh, next talk in May. We will send you the time and the date as soon as possible. Uh, I thank again the um, the committee that is selecting the the, the, the talks. Uh, so Clara, Sarah, Alicia, and Felipe. I would like to thank especially Aurora Science Communication through Felipe, Alejandro, and Daniel that were planning and managing all the technical stuff today. And I would like to thank uh, Juliana Villa, the uh, president of INM that all of us to do this INA, uh, no, not INA, sorry, uh, Nanotox Volume 2. And I guess I see you, all of you, next month for the uh, second talk of Nanotox Volume 2. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you, everybody. And see you next month. Very good.